The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said Israel will carry out an offensive against Hamas in Rafah regardless of whether or not a ceasefire and hostage release deal is reached. In a statement from his office, Mr Netanyahu said that stopping the war before uh, achieving the goal of defeating Hamas was out of the question. As we mentioned earlier, Hamas has still not given its response to the latest ceasefire proposals hammered out during talks in Cairo. The Israeli government has said it won't send a delegation to the Egyptian capital to discuss the deal until Hamas makes its decision known. Well, for more on the latest developments around Gaza, I'm joined now on the line from London by the president of the U.S. Middle East Project, Daniel Levy, who was a former Israeli negotiator and was an advisor in the office of the former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Levy, for taking the time to uh, join us. Let's start with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying that an offensive against Hamas in Rafah will be carried out regardless of whether a ceasefire and hostage release deal is reached. I mean, how does that feed into the latest attempts to agree a truce? Because, I mean, it sounds like an extraordinary thing to say, and I can't think of any better disincentive to Hamas to sign the peace deal. Well, Charles, you, you've done my job for me. You've... I think you've given your audience, if I may say, all they need to know, because this is it. And, and, and if I try to expand and explain, I do the following. Charles, there was an agreement in late November. Dozens, 100 plus of the Israelis being held in Gaza were released. Some of the many thousands and thousands of Palestinians held in Israeli prisons, often without trial, were released. There was a brief pause. After that pause, the situation got exponentially worse for the Palestinians inside Gaza. So since that first limited ceasefire, time limited, Palestinians have seen thousands and thousands of children killed. The further devastation of all the hospitals, of the infrastructure, of the housing stock, starvation. Now, the lesson, therefore, on the... Palestinian Hamas negotiating side was that any future deal has to be an on-ramp for a permanent ceasefire. In the most simple terms, Charles, where we have been stuck ever since is that Prime Minister Netanyahu said no permanent ceasefire, just another short deal. Hamas said this has to be part of a permanent ceasefire. The mediators managed to get to a place where President Biden, finally, having armed Israel and sent more weapons and devastating bombs, he finally got to a place in calls over the last couple of days where he talked about a sustainable ceasefire. So we seem to have some closing of that gap. There is only one way, and you did that, Charles, to interpret the comments today of the Israeli prime minister, namely that he is saying no ceasefire and therefore it is very likely that there will be no deal whatsoever. So p the people will say, ah, Hamas has to give an answer. We're waiting for them. But the Israeli prime minister has given his answer. And it seems that the equation that is held throughout, which Israeli commentators have now made very clear that they understand to be the case and the families of the hostages being held, many of them have said they understand this to be the case is that the Israeli prime minister does not want a deal. His priority is not to get the hostages out. And he sees his own personal political survival linked to the continuation of a very long war. Well, that, that's a very interesting, very um, expansive analysis. And we appreciate that very much. But you, of course, have been uh, a member, if you like, of the Israeli government. I mean, not this one. I mean, you were an advisor in the office of the former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. I mean, where does all this leave the divisions within the Israeli government over what to do next? Because indications are that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is under a lot of pressure from the right who want him to invade Rafah to complete the mission of destroying Hamas and the 
the left who want him to focus on getting the best deal to release the hostages. Really important to break down some of that stuff. First of all, this war mission, this goal, the, the elimination of Hamas, and if you do Rafa, then you complete the job. That is, as we say, for the birds, Charles. No one thinks that is what is happening. Uh, the six-month mark of the war passed just a few weeks ago, and the cost-benefit ledger was being worked out, and most people were saying, sure, there's been some degradation, but on the battlefield, Hamas has not been destroyed. It won't be destroyed. That was an unachievable goal. People have seen this around the world. Hamas is an armed resistance movement. It's also a political movement. It's also fighting an illegal occupation. There's no military solution. There would have to be a political solution. Israel under this government rejects any kind of political solution. Park that for a moment, Charles. The internal political dynamics you had, if people remember, people may uh, still recall that prior to what happened on October the, cell, the 7th, itself a crime, of course, by Hamas, prior to what happened on that date, there was major polarization in Israel, weekly demonstrations against the Netanyahu government. So that polarization remains. Most Israelis continue to support the war. They are not seeing the images most of us are seeing of the devastation coming out of Gaza, and Palestinians have been largely dehumanized in their eyes. Okay. But you do have a split over how important it is to get the hostages out. And that split is seen inside Netanyahu's war cabinet. It may be that the ministers who joined this cabinet at the start of the war may find themselves leaving. But the pressure from the right and Netanyahu's own personal considerations, ideological predilections are driving this, especially if you throw in the crucial variable. And I think it is the crucial variable, Charles which is America. Is the US administration actually willing to use the leverage that it has at its disposal? We perhaps saw signs of a shift, but it seems that's not going to happen. The vetoes at the UN continue to prevail. The arms are still being supplied. And it seems that Netanyahu has a degree of confidence that if push comes to shove and he says it's Hamas's fault, President Biden and his team are not going to say, Mr. Prime Minister, you're the one who undermined this. They will actually collapse, lend credence to Netanyahu's claim, and he will carry the day. Unless he's under a different kind of pressure, that is the fear. That's not going to out. It's not going to improve the conditions for Palestinians in Gaza. And we're going to continue talking about this war, Charles. And uh, Daniel, I want to thank you very much indeed for joining us. Unfortunately, your line will, is breaking up a little there, although we heard everything you said, but the picture was breaking up a bit, so we're going to have to leave it there. But Daniel Levy was a former Israeli negotiator. He was an advisor in the office of the former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, and he's the president of the US Middle East Project. He was talking to me there from London. And just a quick footnote to what he was saying there. The Americans are saying that they can't see any way that a military operation could be carried out in Rafah without causing unacceptable casualties. But we also know that um, given that very sensitive statement that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu made, which potentially could scupper any deal, uh, we know that Mr. Netanyahu did not give any exact timeline for any possible attack on Rafa, so it could just be muscular talk to try and improve Israel's bargaining position. We'll have to wait and see.